first guest is a hugely successful comedian, actor, and entrepreneur. He's the only person I know who could possibly promote both a children's book and a premium tequila in the same talk show appearance. <laughs> the book is Marcus Makes It Big, and the tequila is Gran Coromino. But please, don't drink and read bedtime stories at the same time. <laughs> Say hello to the very funny Kevin Hart! <laughs> Just people standing ovations. No, man, you go? this is uh, this is just here. This has always been one of the best audiences ever when it comes to late night TV. Yeah. Always, always. What's up, man? It's so good to see you. Always. We literally started together. Yes, we yes, were. This is true. Yeah, we were in the Montreal Just for Laughs Festival in New Faces, which yes. is a category they have at this big festival. Two thousand one. Was it two thousand one? I thought it was two thousand two. Two thousand one. Might have been. It might have been two thousand two. I, it's all just a blur at this point. <laughs> and and you, were, you were killing then, you're killing now. Do you have a sense that you'd be playing hockey arenas? I mean, do you uh, know that this is where this whole thing was going? You know what, when you go back there, I think the, the craziest thing about the time that Mike is talking about, um, that's a big deal. Yeah. For, for comics. I mean, if you make it to new faces, yeah. it's all about getting seen by the right people, and hopefully those people can make great decisions that can propel your career into a different place. Yeah. And I remember just being on that show, making it to that. It was so much pressure. It was like, I got to do good. I got to yeah. do good. And you're only thinking about that, right? Yeah. And, and things keep happening. And as they keep happening, you're like, oh, wait, this is where it's going. Oh, wait, it's here now. Oh, yeah. wait, it's here now. So when I finally got to the place where I was doing the arenas, it's a pinch yourself moment because you don't expect it. It, yeah. it kind of progresses into that. And when you realize it, when you do get those wins, they're, they're much bigger. They're, yeah. they're, they mean so much more because those fans have truly grown with you over the years. So, you know, the, the, the world of performing in arenas now, man, is something that I love and I'm excited about every single time. I don't yeah. take it for granted. So yeah. it's not like a, I knew I was going to get there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bitch. I knew <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, that would be off for them. That would be I'm off not, for them. I'm not there. It's not, it's not <laughs> there. It's one, uh, it's one that I'm really humble about and thankful for because I didn't expect to see it. And the fact that I am is dope. Your show uh, for Netflix is a joke festival this week got moved because of the playoffs. I got bumped. I got bumped. <laughs> you got bumped. I got bumped. Yeah. You got bumped because the Kings were in the playoffs. Yes. Yeah. And... By the way, by the way, to book to book my show during that time shows the faith that they had <laughs> in the Kings, right? Uh, there was no not a lot of faith. Not a lot no, of faith. There was no, no faith. No. So I get a call and they're like so <laughs> urgent on a call. Oh God, this is bad. And I'm like, what? The Kings made the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what, what does that mean? They're like, well, we got we to gotta figure this out. We got to uh, figure out the date. So my show at the Crypto.com Arena was on the 6th, and that's the date they needed. And I'm like, look, these things happen. It's unfortunate, but in the world of uh, problem, there's always a solution. So I moved to the 5th. Uh, the sold-out show is still a sold-out show. All the people um, went and just honored the date of the 5th. So it's going to be a good time regardless. But, that's great. you know, it's a, it's a good problem to have. It could, yeah. be, it could be much worse. <laughs> Much worse. <laughs> the, the Chappelle thing was so scary this yeah. week, right? It's... Not scary, but all right. No? <laughs> somebody, somebody ran on stage and got their ass whooped. It's not, it's not, it's not scary. It's not scary. I feel... it's, one, it's, it's one of those things that need to happen, though, right? Like, by the no. way... No! Yes! <laughs> no! What do you mean, no? What do you mean, yes? Okay, Mike, do you want people <laughs> to continue to think that they can cross that line? and break the barrier of entertainer and... Oh, no, and, no, we're okay. on the same side so, of this. Yeah, that's my point. There is a momentary yes. confusion. Well, I don't know how you can get confused there, Mike. Somebody getting their ass whipped sends a message out to other people that was like, you know, I was thinking about doing that, but <laughs> oh, after okay. saying that, I don't really okay, want to do we're that. saying the same thing. I'm saying it's scary that a person attacked Dave in the first place. No, I think, uh, look, I think that the, the world 
that we're in right now, there's a lot of lines that have gotten blurred. Uh, and sometimes you got to take a couple steps backwards to take some steps forward. And I think that moment that we just witnessed with Dave is like, fogging up a bigger moment. Like, Dave just made history at the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah. Dave sold over 70,000 Unbelievable, people. yeah, yeah, yeah. And Dave went back after that and finished doing the show yeah. and didn't let that thing be a big thing. Yeah. He quickly moved on from it and got back to doing comedy, and that's what a professional does. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, these moments of improfessionalism should not break uh, professionals. They they shouldn't shape or mold the world that we're now being seen or viewed in. So I think it's time to get back to a place of respect for your live yeah, entertainer yeah. and understand what you're yeah. to the show. I agree. So, uh, what is... Because you've done all kinds of gigs over the years. It's like, what's the most unhinged audience member you've ever had? Um, I mean, the worst one is when I got hit with a, a buffalo wing. I talked about that for a long time. <laughs> That, that happened. That's the that's the worst one. That's a famous in, story. In the clubs? Yeah, something, something, yeah, in the clubs. Somebody threw a buffalo wing at me. Um, but but here's like here's what people have forgotten. In stand-up comedy, it's always been the world of heckler and comedian. Comedian has always dealt with heckler. Yeah. Heckler has always shouted out things because he felt that he could. A comedian's way of shutting that down was to say things back. It wasn't, it wasn't bullying, it wasn't picking on, it was all done in fun. We've now lost the sight of the relationship of audience to comedian. And that line has gotten blurred to where it's like, well, I don't need to do this and like this, and I can stand up and make a point. Well, it becomes a, a hard case of, well, why did you come? Yeah. Why did you, why did you buy a ticket if yeah. that was your want or need? So when I say we need to get back to the place of respecting the entertainer, respect the craft. If you're coming, come to have a good time and enjoy the person that you saw. If you have no interest in that, you don't have to buy a ticket. Yeah, you don't yeah have that's to go. right. You don't have to go. I've always found it... I, I, you know, I have my podcast working it out, and it's all about the comedy writing process. I find it fascinating with you, because you're one of my favorite comics, that you don't write jokes longhand. No. You come up with premises, you throw them on stage, you see what happens, you try it out the next night. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's that's always worked for me, because I, if it's too written, too rehearsed or broken down, I don't find the the fresh perspective in it. Yeah. I like the struggle. I yeah. like not knowing where it's going. My writing process is just, it's live, it's in action. Yeah. And those bullet points, okay, I remember this, I remember that, I remember this. I just go up on bullet points every time. You know, it takes me about a year, year and a half yeah. to come up with an hour of material because of the way that I do it. Yeah. I go from the comedy club to the theater, yeah. smaller side of an arena, then the bigger side, but it's all in stages. Yeah. So my, 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 uh, my system, I don't recommend for everybody, but it's worked for me over the course of the years. Yeah. I also got a photographic memory, too. No, I've heard this about you. Yeah, you I got just, a photographic you, memory. Like, when you're memorizing lines for a movie or something, you're, you see it, you're done. Fast. Really? All in context. And you always have that when you, since you were a kid? Always. The day that that goes away, my career's over. <laughs> the, day, the day that it goes away, it's over. I'm, now I'm worried. I'm telling you. Now I'm worried. But you know what it is, though? When it comes to movies and the lines in movies, my lines should be based off of what you said. Yeah. So good writing is reactive, You're, right? Yeah. So when you say something, my line should basically be teed up off that's of right. what you said. And that's how I get the world of context. It's more about what you say. I'm reacting to it. So it's easier for me to remember. It doesn't matter how big the monologue, how big the paragraph. But what happens if the lines aren't, are, aren't a great response? Then I change them. <laughs> You heard it here, Hollywood. I changed it. Kevin Hart changes the lines. Yeah, I changed it. Now, I can, I changed them now. I, early, <laughs> earlier in my career, I had to deal with it, but not now. during, not during new faces. Yeah, not, now, <laughs> now I can go. That don't make sense. And then, and I gotta listen to it. But back then, I couldn't. More with Kevin Hart after this. Welcome back. We're here with Kevin Hart. Kevin wrote this book. It's called Marcus Makes It Big. And uh, it's it's a it's a kids chapter book. You yes. do I, what don't you do, Kevin? This is unbelievable. Uh, you know what? I'm trying to honestly do it all, uh, <laughs> and the reason for it is simply why not? I think uh, the sky is truly the limit, and the more that you do, the more that you realize you can do. So for me, it was uh it was about the books that I felt weren't there when I was a kid. Yeah. And, 
you know, for kids that look like me that come from where I come from, That's right. you want to have things that can inspire um, and ignite their ability to dream and want. So the world of Mark is, is simply that. It's, uh, it's for the young creative mind, right, that yeah. wants to do something but is always told that they can't. Um, and you need to find some, some wiggle room when you hear no's. You need to find some, some true belief when everybody's telling you that you can't do something or you can't achieve. In this case, Marcus is a kid that heard it and didn't believe that what they were saying was true. So he figured out a way to do the thing that he wanted. And Marcus Makes a Movie, Marcus Makes a Movie was the first one. And this one, uh, this is my second one. It's all parallel to, of course, my life to some degree <laughs> and the things that I went through, the things that I've experienced. So so I think to <laughs> truly start out at the bottom and be an example of making it to the top in some way, shape, or form, it, it, it's incentivized. it incentivizes the youth in yeah. some way. And yeah. you can, you can and, also, and also, it takes a comedian to have a sort of autobiographical character <laughs> be this yes. snazzy looking man. Yes, yes. <laughs> with yes, the, the sunglasses. With the legs. With the, with the legs. legs and the sunglasses. <laughs> By the way, that was a specific ass for me. Yeah. He came back and his legs were too big at one point. I said, no, <laughs> no, no, he's gotta have little legs, little legs. Uh, you know what, man, the, the, the whole creative process um, in literature, right, it's, it's so, it's so amazing, and IP, it starts out here, right? And if Marcus basically becomes a phenomenon at the years and kids loved it, well, that becomes TV, books, or, or lunch boxes, toys, whatever. So you go back to the ground level, and ground zero is here, is where it starts. And if you can find right. some love, some happiness, and some excitement in it, I promise you it'll pay off. And for me, I'm truly enjoying the world of Marcus uh, and what it's now turning into. And I can't wait to get to volume five and look back and, and remember where I was. And it's something that my kids, my kids are even part of. My kids Aww. love Marcus, and they're, That's they, so they're a part of the story and understand. I love that. Well, that's why I get a lot of the stuff. That's why I get a lot of the lingo. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta sure. talk to my kids for the right. lingo. Of course, yeah. Yeah, I don't, which is why I'm still using words like lingo. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Are you, is Mother's Day big in your household? You're uh, a father of four? I'm a father of four. Yeah. Yes, a lot of kids. Mother's Day has to be big, regardless of It's gotta of what, be, right? What, whatever. You gotta go big with Mother's Day. Yeah, have to. Well, yeah. It's, look. It's not about going big, it's about the acknowledgement. Yeah. Let's all understand. Yeah. Uh, acknowledging moms That's all nice. over yeah. is True. what we should do. Right? Absolutely. Um, so in my house, we do make a big deal out of it. You know, we, we do make sure that uh, we make we make mom feel special on that day. It's uh, it's extremely different from Father's Day. Uh, <laughs> you know, extremely different. Yes, it is different. Yeah. Uh, I have noticed that. It's a big deal. Not to say that they don't give a shit, but I feel like they don't give a shit. Um, I didn't. Oh, I don't day. agree or disagree. Yeah, right? I'm agnostic it's on not, this. It's not yeah, the yeah. same. The, the same effort and energy isn't put into it. Uh, <laughs> I just get some some eggs thrown on a plate and it's chucked at me. Uh, <laughs> But we make a big deal, and we should, out of Mother's Day. So looking you, forward to it. Do you have parenting advice? Uh, communicate. Communicate with your kids, right? Um, it's all about the conversation, especially today. Yeah. The, the words and the sharing of words between you and your children is so important because there, there are no bad talks, right? Yeah. And, the more that my kids understand that, the more we talk. That's, that's the best piece of advice that I got that I can say I've put to use. My advice that I would give anybody, I'm a firm believer um, with the, the younger kids and letting the young kids do stupid stuff so they learn not to do it anymore. Yeah. I'm a firm that's, believer in that. That's, like, a huge, that's a huge thing. Yeah, I'm not... I'm not the like the the dad, the overprotective dad that baby proofed the house and all of that stuff. I'm I'm a firm believer Man. of leave them corners there. Let that baby, <laughs> let that baby in that's here. A, yeah. That's the that's the that's yeah. the next Kevin Hart book. Let leave them baby, corners there. Leave them corners there. And it, oh Kevin my God. Kevin Hart's guide to baby proofing. Oh leave them God. corners there. Mike, I gotta write this down. <laughs> leave. Leave those corners there. This is genius. It's a children's book, and it's about the, it's about the wear and tear that a natural home environment put on the baby, and and the baby starts off just not knowing, but by the end of the book, the baby is scared of certain corners. <laughs> oh, this is genius. Kevin Hart, everybody.
Marcus makes it big, and Grand Cormino Tequila are both available now. Thanks, Kevin. We'll be back with Hannah Einbinder. Ta -da -da.